After I interviewed with Steve Jobs, my friend asked Steve what Steve thought of me. And Steve said to him something to the effect of, well, you know, he's okay, but if he doesn't succeed, I'm going to fire you too. What's up, everybody? Derek Ting here. Welcome to Be Super, a series where we talk to high achieving leaders to learn more about them so we might learn more about ourselves. Today, we're talking about influence, social media, and its future. What better person to discuss this with than evangelist, author, and speaker Guy Kawasaki? He was the chief evangelist at Apple. He's written 15 best selling books and has averaged 50 speeches a year. He's currently the chief evangelist of Canva and the creator of the remarkable people podcast. Welcome, Mr. Guy Kawasaki. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to get to it so people can learn as much as possible from you. But who, who came up with the job title evangelist? You or Apple? Uh, in 1983, I was a software evangelist at Apple. And it was during 95 to 97 that I was Apple's chief evangelist. Uh, evangelist comes from a Greek word meaning bringing the good news. So in the Christian sense, the good news is eternal life. In the software evangelist Apple sense, the good news that we brought was greater creativity and productivity by using Macintosh. And, and I think the way that we evangelized Macintosh was that we positioned it not as yet another personal computer, but an appliance and all the positive uh, connotations that come with that, i.e. plug it in, it's easy to use, you know, anybody can use it, anybody can have it. And we kind of positioned it as a, an appliance for the mind. And it would make anybody more creative and productive. You didn't need an IT staff or an MIS department or to become a computer nerd in order to be more creative and productive. Let's let's rewind a little bit back. I wanted to ask you mm -hmm. about because I read in your book about you working at a place called Nova, and you were selling mm -hmm. diamonds. So, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> yep, <laughs> I did my research. There, how, how did you? Yeah, you did. How did that set you up? I would say that it inadvertently set me up because when I graduated from my MBA program, the first job that I took was working for a fine jewelry manufacturer in downtown Los Angeles. And at that company, I was in sales and marketing. And sales and marketing in a jewelry company, family owned, is not sales and marketing at a Fortune 500 brand. So sales and marketing in a small jewelry manufacturer is hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know, dealing with competition from other sales reps, dealing with trade shows, where you're on the floor, flying your ass all over the country. And this was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the thing that I learned in this position at Nova Stylings was how to sell and well, such a valuable skill. So uh, that's, that's where it started. Now, I can't tell you that I sat down one day and said, okay, guy, you want to be in high tech. The first logical step for you is to go into jewelry. <laughs> not at all, pal. So uh, that's not logical at all. Uh, and I had a psych degree. And a lot of people think, oh, guy had a psych degree because he had a plan to go into sales and marketing and evangelism. Again, not at all. Like, I majored in psych because that was the easiest major I could find at Stanford. So that's how it worked. But, you know, with hindsight, luckily, knock on wood, every metaphor you ever want to use, the, the stint in the jewelry business taught me how to sell and how to become trustworthy. And that has been extremely valuable for the rest of my career. You know, in your talks and speeches, I've heard you preface a lot of accomplishments with the humble brag, which I love. <laughs> how did you <laughs> yeah, how did you learn to do this so eloquently? It's like, you know, self-promotional, but it's sort of your style and it works. I mean, it totally works. How did, how did that come about? It's primarily my father. So my father, he definitely hammered into me this concept of, you know, you're fortunate, you're lucky, don't take things for granted. You owe a debt to society, uh, a sense of noblesse oblige that 
You know, you, you have a moral responsibility to help others. And w- when you go through the door of opportunity, don't close it behind you. Uh, even better, open it up further. So that was all upbringing. So he spent a lot of time with you growing up too, as well. Uh, I think so. I mean, it's a long time ago, but you know, he's, you know, he, th- this, listen, he was, he was a real estate broker and he worked for the Honolulu fire department. So it wasn't like he was a traveling salesman out on the road, you know, 250 days a year. So I, I grew up in a lower middle-class neighborhood with, in a lower middle-class family. So, um, now, don't get me wrong. Uh, I, I, it's not like I was starving and didn't have money for food and clothes and books. Uh, really, until I got to Stanford, um, I had very little understanding of uh, what being rich meant. <laughs> but I figured it out quickly. But I, I really, you know, the, if you're from Honolulu, you'd be familiar. So I, I grew up in Kalihi Valley, which is kind of a slum. And there were parts of the island, particularly Wailai Kahala and Diamond Head, that yeah, going there was like going to Disneyland. It was just, you know, unheard of. In your books and your podcasts, I love the story that you tell about being mistaken for Jackie Chan while driving. How has that experience like <laughs> driven you to work harder? Like, yes. Where does this competitiveness well, come from? When you ask many people uh, what motivates them, you get some pretty good American Idol beauty contest kind of statements about ending poverty, reducing the digital divide, reducing climate change. When I was in high school, I was robbed on a public transportation bus twice, uh, two, two different instances, not you know, twice the same time. And also in high school, a family friend gave me a ride in his Porsche 911. And then in college, I had a very rich roommate. And one year I went home with him to his house for a holiday. And so you have to understand this. So I, I'm, I'm coming from Kalihi Valley. Very, very mixed neighborhood of uh, Hawaiian Islanders, Filipinos, uh, you know, just like local locals. Okay. And so we land in Phoenix and his father picks us up in a Rolls Royce. So, so my head is exploding already. And then we go to his house and his family's backyard is the golf course of the Arizona Biltmore. Coming from this slum near public housing in Kalihi Valley, now I'm at this guy's house and his backyard is the golf course of the best hotel in Arizona. My head is further exploding. And then we go out to dinner and his mother gets tired and asks me to drive her home in her car. The valet comes and guess what her car is? It's a Ferrari Daytona. As opposed to these great answers about what motivated you to study and work so hard. And you know, some people, of course, saying that they wanted to change the world with a great deal of blatant honesty. I will tell you that my goal was not to change the world. My goal was to change the car and to not live someplace where I was going to be robbed on public transportation. And that's what motivated me. Those four instances motivated me. Don't get me wrong. I just said, guy, you are going to study and you're going to work hard and you're going to, you know, you're going to raise yourself out of this. You're willing to do what it takes. So were there a lot of things where a lot of times people are not willing to put in the work? Well, I live a charm life. Okay. So because of an elementary school teacher, she convinced my parents to take me out of the public school system in Hawaii, which was a challenging situation and put me into a college prep school. So because I went to this college prep school called Iolani, uh, I got into Stanford. And because I got into Stanford, I met this guy you know, the, from the rich family who eventually hired me into Apple. A truly pivotal part of my life was when I went into the high tech business because of this roommate at Stanford, because he hired me. And honestly, that was 90% nepotism. Because if you looked at my background, I didn't have a computer science background. And if you looked at my work experience, it was primarily jewelry. So without the right work experience and the right education, I got hired into the Macintosh division because of nepotism. And there's a lesson there, which is, of course, you know, be nice to the people you meet in college. But an even greater lesson is that it's not how or why you got a job. It's what you do with it afterwards. 
So I got in because of nepotism, but nepotism would not carry you very far in some place that Steve Jobs ran. Uh, it had to be competence. And so knock on wood, nepotism got me in. But then after that, it was because of my grit and my hard work and good fortune that I am where I am. Yeah. And I think your your attitude that, hey, your friend, your friend helped, but then you kind of owed him to, to prove your worth. Yes, absolutely. Because actually, you know, uh, after I, after I, this is a great story. After I interviewed with Steve Jobs, my friend asked Steve what Steve thought of me. And Steve said to him something to the effect of, well, you know, he's okay, but if he doesn't succeed, I'm going to fire you too. So, so that was the ringing endorsement I had <laughs> After my job interview, anyone yep, listening out there, that's, you know, it, it happened already. I mean, that was, what was he, <laughs> these were early days. How intimidating was he to you? Were you intimidated? Because you're, you're confident. On a scale person. of, yeah. I am confident now, but <laughs> this was in 1983. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I, I would say on a scale of one to 10, Steve Jaw, you know, where 10 is intimidating, he was like a 12. You know, all the all the HR theories you hear about, you meet with employees, you communicate with them, you manage them, you focus on positive things, you always highlight the good things and you figure out how to uh, fix the bad things and, you know, honky-dory, kumbaya, meeting of the minds, you know, self-actualization of goals, providing value, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then there was Steve Jobs. So I'll tell you something. Steve Jobs motivated by fear. The fear he motivated by was that if he didn't like the job that you were doing, he would not hesitate to rip you in front of anybody, including the whole division. And I saw him rip a few people in public. And I said, I am not going to be that guy. I am not going to be humiliated like that. So fear, contrary to every HR theory you've ever heard, is a very powerful motivating force. Now, I'm not recommending this as a way for people to run their company. But I have to tell you, it worked. Well, I feel like he was he was that good, though. And, and you're, and, you know, and, and yeah. obviously throughout your years, years, you've, you've, also proven that you're just that good. Uh, I will tell you that in the back of my mind, I, I always kind of think that I'm only as good as my last speech or I'm only as good as my last book or I'm only as good as my last podcast interview. You may have a body of work and you may have a history, but if you make one lousy speech or you make one lousy podcast appearance or whatever, you know, there are people who are just going to form a permanent opinion of you because of that data point. They're not going to go back and look at the, the entire career that you had. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, how do you give so many speeches a year? Uh, don't, don't you ever get bored and all that? And it's true. You know, I mean, I've given some of these speeches hundreds of times, but I just keep thinking in, in the back of my mind that, you know, you may have given this speech a thousand times, but there are people in the audience who have never seen you before. And this is going to be the one time they see you. So they're not going to say, oh, the previous, you know, 2,999 times. He was great. He sucked when we were there, but he's great, you know, statistically. All they're going to say is he sucked. And so I keep that in the back of my mind all the time that uh, it, it's kind of, let's say you go to Las Vegas, right? And you go to the Wayne Newton show and he sings Don Shane and it sucks. Okay. He's probably sick of singing Don Shane. He's probably sung it tens of thousands of times, but you go to Las Vegas and you go to the Wayne Newton show, he has to sing Don Shane as if it's the first time he ever sang it. You are a couple from Peoria, Illinois, and this is the first time you came to Las Vegas and you got tickets for the Wayne Newton show, and you expect Wayne Newton to give the greatest rendition of Don Shane ever given. And that's how I feel. I feel like I have to prove myself every day. Mm, I love that. I, I, and I feel like I go through that <laughs> all the time as well. Like no matter how much yeah. you've done. And, but, but at you know, least they the, don't okay, think let's, you're let's, Robert Kiyosaki. 
<laughs> I love that. I love that. I love. Well, I love the self-deprecation about yourself that you're you're fine to joke about it. You know, you just call it out, and then it becomes funny, yeah. and it's it is what it is. And, you know, those things you can't change. Um, you can't. <laughs> but uh, you know, that's the world. Like the world mistaking you for for you know, rich dad, poor dad all the time is is kind of it's annoying I, I get great amusement are you on clubhouse by any chance yeah 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 totally totally yeah so re read my clubhouse profile you will get a kick out of my clubhouse profile oh I, even me. just oh, look <laughs> even just you putting ask me anything i'm like man i love you because you just have you have balls <laughs> i mean it's just like ask me anything <laughs> just so you know there's another story to my ask me anything some people find a controversial i find just a no-brainer and i'm not going to change it and what i do for my clubhouse clubs or clubhouse rooms or conferences or whatever the term is so i i do these ask me anything where literally you can just ask me anything i'm not saying i have the answer for it but i only let women come on stage and ask me questions the reason is that i think that the voice of women have been silenced for so long that in my little tiny speck of the universe women are going to have a voice and they're going to be heard and they're going to have the microphone and they're going to have a podium and they're going to have a platform so in my clubhouse ask me anything's only women get brought on stage and ask questions I guarantee you there is nobody else on Clubhouse who does that. No, and you're you're rocking the boat, I think, because a lot of it a lot of, a lot of the talks are, are are pretty boring actually. Oh my god. Like like I I think, well, I have to tell you, you know, my first reaction to Twitter was negative too, but at Clubhouse there are so many clubs that are, you know, the millionaires dinner club and it's it's basically people convincing other people they're successful and know the secret to getting rich quick. And if you just DM them or go to Instagram or tweet them, you know, you'll get a link to their free online course and then you can buy their book and you can pay for their seminar and you, know, you too can be successful and get rich quick. And so the, the other day I saw a, a club about vaccination where the title of the club, the guy had misspelled Pfizer. So oh, I saw know, that so too. Like, Right? Like, so I'm going to go into a room about vaccination where the guy doesn't know how to spell Pfizer and believe that I should listen to what they're saying about vaccination? Well, we live in this age of misinformation. I think that's, I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm yeah. doing this podcast is because, you know, I'm, I'm tired of sifting through and I'm, I'm going, I'm, you know, I go to the best, I go to the best. I've done it. Yeah. I've read Ape. I've read Ape and it's very practical. No, oh, you did? Yeah, huh. yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's not fluffy. It's like, here are 10 steps. <laughs> this is what you do. Go to these resources. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Um, but then, you know, but, of course, you, you know, can I, paint it well with 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 stories, but it's it's like you gain so much knowledge well, out of that. So, well, I, you know, I, in my business books, I'm trying to write the book that I would want to read. And so if I was a writer and I wanted to self-publish a book, I truly want to know, you know, so do I use Microsoft Word or do I use Google Docs? Um, how do I find a copy editor? How do I find a content editor? How do I design the page? I mean, that's what you really want to know. And if you want to know, you know, higher things about personal creativity and speaking with your inner voice, don't come to Guy. Come to Guy for when <laughs> you want to know, you know, this is the Microsoft Word template that I think you should use and why every single paragraph is assigned a style. Um, that's the level that I exist at. But what, what people need if they want to, you know, truly understand writing is they need to read Julia Cameron. They need to read Brenda Euland. And then they need to read Guy Kawasaki when you want to implement. I know Mindset was a book that changed My, you. Mindset is another book that changed. Uh, that is written by Carol Dweck, a Stanford professor. And the gist of Mindset is that you can either have a growth mindset or you can have a fixed mindset. There are two kinds of fixed mindset. One fixed mindset says that I've been told that I'm a natural, I'm a genius, I'm brilliant. And so in my mind, you know, I am fixed as a genius and superior and intellectual and blah, blah, blah. One of the consequences of that is if you think you're perfect and such an intellectual, you don't try 
things that you're not good at. Because if you've been told you're a prodigy and then you try something and you fail, that is just going to, you know, ruin your self-image that here I thought I was perfect and I'm a prodigy and I try something and I suck at it. So that's one kind of fixed mindset. Um, and the other kind of fixed mindset is, I, I, you know, I've kind of learned everything I can learn. I don't want to try anything new, not necessarily because of risk of failure, but, you know, there's nothing else to learn. And the growth mindset, by contrast, looks at the world as a rising tide floats all boats. And, you know, at 44, you can take up ice hockey and at 60, you can take up surfing. That's the growth mindset. I think this is a good point to ask you, where do you think the future of influence and evangelism is going? Well, I think that uh, social media has changed influence in humongous ways because it used to be when I was evangelizing Macintosh in the mid 80s, uh, this is prior to cell phones. I mean, if you were cool, you had a fax machine, literally. Not everybody had a fax machine even. So evangelism was pack your bags, get on an airplane or drive your car. And if you're cool, you send people a fax. This is before even email. So you know, now social media is fast and free and ubiquitous and you can create clubhouse clubs. It's just God's greatest gift to entrepreneurs and marketers. Now, having said that, we all know the horror stories, but I think that's true of anything that, you know, you could say, well, Gutenberg invented the printing press, best thing ever. Now, you know, there are much more books. Yeah, but the printing press created manuals for how to create you know, weapons of mass destruction. The printing press didn't only publish good stuff and neither does the internet. So what I think is necessary for society to really survive is that I think at about eight, nine or 10 years old, every student should be taught how to use the internet because we teach students how to write and how to read and how to yeah, do math, but we don't teach them how to use the internet and we give them a smartphone. And so, yeah, a very good example is that I think that many people think that any website that ends in .org is a good, clean, honest, reputable, not-for-profit, seeking to make the world a better place because it's a .org. They don't realize that anybody with 20 bucks could create a .org website. And so the, the test that a company or an organization is a .org is basically meaningless. Now, how many people think that? Not that many. Um, and that's the kind of basic literacy that should be taught. How, did, how, how would you go around changing that, though? There's a, I, for my podcast, I interviewed someone, um, a Stanford professor in history, and, you know, he talks about this, that you know, people have to learn how to use the internet. And in particular, he says, uh, this is a very good analogy, you know, much of our search is vertical. That way, that is, we land on a website that Google has provided in its first page, and we go deep into the website. So if you're looking up, let's say, um, pros and cons of minimum wage, you type something like that minimum wage into Google, and you click on a website and then you go and you read deeply into that website. You know, first of all, it's a .org and then you, you figure out in the abouts, you know, that it is uh, a quote, not for profit who seeks to uh, ensure the economic growth of America. And uh, with the belief that the, a minimum wage will raise prices for everybody and mean fewer jobs or, you know, something like that. And you think, oh, my God, you know, that makes perfect sense. I'm on a dot org. This is a reputable place, blah, blah, blah. So um, Sam Weinberger, the professor at uh, history at Stanford, well, he says, you know, stop going so vertical. You need to go horizontal. And I'll give you an example. So if you encounter a website like that, go to the contact us or about page and grab the physical address and type that physical address into Google. And you will be amazed that sometimes, and I did this, you type in a physical address and then come to find out it's the same address as a PR firm 
Okay. So you go to a PR firm's website and the PR firms, all their clients are huge companies. You immediately, your, your um, alarm detector should go off. Like, okay, so this, this website is talking about uh, preserving opportunities for employment for Americans by not having a minimum wage. And it's the same address as the PR firm. Obviously, there's some conflict there. A company uh, association. Yeah, why, so why that's did one get thing. Told in the first place, because of a PR company. Exactly. Kind of for the audience, the name of the series is Be Super, and um, you know what you just did was really break it down from you know we should do this to you know understanding it. Um, this is you know this is the acronym: understanding it, planning it, executing it, and then reviewing what's going on. And I think that's that's what you're obviously doing with the dot org thing, and that's. That's awesome. I want to ask you one one final question. Um, okay. I, I I love this. In your bio, you said you know guy has the golden touch, meaning whatever yeah. is gold, he touches. So right. what what do you have in your your fingers on lately? Well, I mean, Canva is the mother of all golden touches, right? So um, for for your listener, a lot of people say or think, especially on Clubhouse, that they have the golden touch. And the way the golden touch works on Clubhouse is they touch you and it turns to gold. I don't believe in that theory. So my theory is whatever is gold, guy touches. And what this represents is my awareness and conclusion that if you want to be a great salesperson, a great marketing person, a great evangelist, evangelize, market, and sell something great because it is so hard to evangelize, sell, and market crap. Duh. But that duhism is not understood by many people. So if you want to be a great evangelist, evangelize Macintosh or evangelize Canva. It has to be good news. It, that sounds like a duhism, but you'd be amazed um, that some people think that, you know, evangelism, you can just turn it on to anything and it'll work. It will not work. And what I wanted to mention here was that, um, that you edit your own podcast. I do. I was editing just before I came on here. Right. Yeah. And then, I mean, I know that that's one of the key points for your books is, you know, editing. What's the difference between the two and editing a book, your own book is harder because the written word is more permanent. So because there are rules of grammar and spelling that have to be done right for the written word, whereas editing a podcast uh, you know, nobody's complaining about the lack of a serial comma or that should be an M dash, not an N dash. And very few people are going to complain and say, well, your guest was speaking in the passive voice and the passive voice is weaker. So that kind of discussion doesn't happen. So my podcast features interviews of remarkable people and it's 95% them talking, 5% me. And I spend two or three hours editing every episode before I give it to the sound designer who spends another five hours editing it. And it's because um, I guess there are two theories in podcasting. One is you just record it as if it's a conversation and you put it out there. That's not my theory. My theory is that a podcast is a work of art. And my job is to get the art out of the raw audio file. And so that means, you know, kind of like a sculpture, you have to remove stuff to have the beauty come out. So I remove stuff. You must have spent maybe in, in the beginning a lot of time sort of just developing your own voice for the podcast or? Yeah, I tell people my positioning statement for my podcast, which some people get really pissed off about, but such is life. Uh, I tell people that my podcast is like NPR without the pledge drive. That's that's my goal. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't know that. Wow, and that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I honestly, I was born to be a podcaster. I just, this is, I have found my calling. And I, I truly do believe that my podcast is the best work that I've ever done in my career. Ironic, it's also the least appreciated. People have not yet discovered my podcast. So when they do, I, I told my wife, after I die, people are going to realize how great my podcast is. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I will. I will change that. I will help you change okay. that at least. Thank you. If I if I just get one percent of the people in Hong Kong to listen to my podcast, I will be doing well. So well, so so if you ever visit here, by the way, you know, uh, I'm going to plant people around you. Though, I'm going to be like, whoa, look, there's guy Kawasaki, Jackie Chan. There's Jackie Chan. <laughs> I, I have enjoyed I have enjoyed my visits to Hong Kong and I just love that train. You know that train that takes you from the airport to the city. Oh yeah. The and that's Express. so it's so efficient. And then it's kind of like when you land in London, you get the Heathrow Express. I like to get to the city right away. So I love dim sum. So <laughs> you're invited. <laughs> you're invited. Okay. You're invited. Guy, thanks so much for all your advice. I enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> all righty. All righty. Well, thank you very much and be well and um, say hello to Jackie if you see him. <laughs> I want you to go up to Jackie Chan and I want you to say, are you Guy Kawasaki? And I want you to record the whole thing. Okay. That would be freaking priceless. Okay. Okay.